Welcome to season six of Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about a family's anxiety and all the big feelings too. We tackle the serious stuff without being too serious. And I'm your co-host, Robin. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author. And I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. I'll give you concrete steps to take and the words to say. Hey, Lynn, there's something I want to talk with you about today that I've been thinking about. I was traveling and I got my hair cut and blown dry by this adorable young guy and he had started dating someone. And throughout the cut and blow dry service, I was thrown back in time to being a 20 something and dating. Because he was talking about, oh my gosh, what does this mean? And then he did this and oh my gosh, and oh my gosh. So all of a sudden I was back in my own single days thinking about these conversations. And this is what he really didn't appreciate, I'm sure, coming from some 50 something woman. I was like, dude, okay, separate from what's going on in your relationship, this is anxiety talk. And I really want you to read my sister-in-law's book. (laughs) And I was like, no, no, just hear me out. It was really, it was all about anxiety. And then it occurred to me how I, of course, also brought all of my own anxiety patterns when I was dating. I didn't have names for them. I wasn't aware of them. And then I just realized, oh my gosh, dating, which is so uncertain, is just a minefield of anxiety patterns. How we talk about dating and how we all talk about the uncertainty and what does this mean is sort of accepted. What if we really wanted to call out the anxiety for what it was and try and figure out how to shift our dating patterns to not include our anxiety patterns? For one, I will tell you, like I find when I go to hairdressers, and I have a few that I've gone to for a long time, but I find young hairdressers exhausting. Because they do talk about this all the time. And then God forbid they find out what I do for a living. So you're saying that maybe this hairdresser didn't appreciate your unsolicited book recommendation. But I'll tell you, if they find out what I do, oh my God, I'm just like, please, please stop talking. So anyway, that's my experience oftentimes. It just cut my hair. Just cut. Yeah, just be quiet. To stop. Yeah. But I feel like that a lot too. I mean, on planes, you know, I've talked about this on planes. I do not tell people what I do for a living. I don't make eye contact. Like I just am like, I don't want to give you all this advice. It makes you sound like a grump and you're not a grump at all. And you've actually told me about certain flights you've had where you've had the most delightful conversations with people too. So I just want to defend you that you're not a curmudgeon the way you're coming across at all. Yeah. Like the dentist who proposed, like that was interesting. But I said, no, he proposed to me. I don't know that story. Oh yeah. Well, that's a long story, but I'm on a flight back from, I think I was coming back from Phoenix or Las Vegas and there was a dentist convention and they were all flying back to Boston. And so I was between two dentists that had just had apparently the time of their lives at the dental convention. But anyway, I did get a marriage proposal, but I don't really think it was an earnest proposal. I think that he was just sort of riding the wave of, and I don't even know if he was single. I hope he was, but I wasn't. Yeah. (laughs) So anyway, so that's a whole different story. If we think about relationships and dating, the reason that it becomes this fertile ground for all of this worry, all this anxiety, is because remember that worry is about doubt. It's about not knowing. Even if we talk about it in terms of friendships or whenever something comes up that there's a lot of doubt or a lot of uncertainty, it's going to grab hold. And I think this was your experience with a hairdresser. I don't think that people recognize it as this is my doubt doing its thing. I don't think they recognize that. Not at all. That's what I'm saying. It is culturally accepted to freak out when you're dating someone and to wonder and to talk incessantly with your friends about what do you think this means and what do you think will happen and what should I do? That's just part of it. And I just wanted to sort of turn that upside down. This is what people with social anxiety do. This is also what people who have OCD do. And one of the things that's interesting to me as you bring this up is that there's this thing, which I don't really buy into all this. I should say, I don't do this, but there's this thing called relationship OCD. And people think it's like a category of OCD. And all it is, is just a place where doubt shows up. 
just like you're saying, like, what do you think that text meant? Or he didn't respond to me or she didn't respond to me in two days. Like, do you think that means something? Or when they said this, and you can get absolutely caught up in the minutia of all the different things that somebody said or did or didn't say, and it can make you crazy. And what we really want is to date somebody and it's kind of a tryout, right? It's an audition. It's a rehearsal to see if the two of you are compatible and you invite your anxiety into it. You invite your worry into it. And suddenly it's not you trying to figure out whether you're a good match with this person. It's your doubt, your worry, your anxiety, seeking certainty and going a little nuts. And I think that's probably what you were feeling when you were listening to that hairdresser. Say you're a 17 or 19 year old person and you're with your friends and you really spiral and talk about and show texts and ask questions all faced with doubt, they would not think anything was weird about that. Right. But if you switch the content, you showed the same level of spiraling about what do you think this text means or some sort of social anxiety situation, it would give your friends a little bit more of a distance to say, hey, you're kind of worked up about this. Let's focus on not being so worked up about this. Right. And you're exactly right. I also think that in relationships in general, we give a lot more space for this kind of perseverating as normal. And some of it is, right? I mean, you're trying to figure things out. When you're giving that example and you're saying you're with your friends and you're looking at every text and talking about this all the time, what if you were doing that about some little bump that you had on your ear? What if you were doing that about whether or not you should get another piercing? Your friends would be like, why are we talking about your ear again? So whenever we get into a situation where somebody is stuck on something, then we begin to see the pattern. What is interesting, and I think what you're saying, is that there are certain topics that we find more acceptable than others to perseverate about. When people start perseverating about a physical ailment, if you were 16 or you were 18 or you were 25 and you were talking about your stomach issue, if you were talking about your gluten intolerance, if you were talking, that would turn people off really quickly. But there is this sort of social acceptability of getting really engaged and really ruminative and really worried about social relationships. And in reality, your friends are actually just as annoyed if you were talking about your stomach, but they don't feel like they can say that to your face. It does bother friends too. You can talk too much about your relationship. But I love this new perseverating. It's a new word for me. Why don't you define that in case I'm not the only one? Yeah. Perseverating means that you're just going over something over and over and over again. So it's very similar to ruminating. So when you're perseverating, you're thinking about something and just like ruminating, it feels like problem solving. So you're bringing something up, you're talking about it over and over again. It's just a way of trying to seek certainty. So say you get a text from somebody that you're interested in and you read the text over and over and over again and you talk about it and you take it apart and you do this, that's perseverating. We could put it in that category of repetitive negative thinking. It's just needing to work through something over and over and over again. And one of the things I often talk about is, does therapy do the disorder, right? So if you're depressed and you keep going to therapy and all you're doing is ruminating about the past, you're in therapy doing the disorder. If you are anxious, if you have these anxious patterns and you go into therapy and all you're doing is perseverating about something over and over and over again, then you're going to therapy and you're just doing the disorder and you're paying somebody to join you in it. So it's just another repetitive negative thinking pattern for sure. Yeah. Okay. So when we come back, we're going to talk about dating without perseverating and how we can also talk to our teenagers about some of these things as they begin their dating life. Hey, Lynn, wouldn't you say that it's almost as important to raise financially literate kids as it is emotionally intelligent kids? 
Of course, because I'm always talking about the big skills that we want our kids to have, decision-making, autonomy, being able to step in the world independently, and starting early, giving kids the opportunity to learn how to manage their money and make good financial decisions. It's a great idea. So we have a lifesaver recommendation you need to check out called Greenlight. Greenlight's a debit card and money app made for families, and it gives kids and teens an easy and fun way to gain financial literacy. And it gives parents a peace of mind. Yeah, you can do things like send instant money transfers. You can automate allowance. You can also keep an eye on your kids' spending with real-time notifications. Kids can begin their journey toward financial autonomy, and you know how I love autonomy, by learning how to save, invest, and spend wisely. The app includes a chores feature where you can set up recurring or one-time chores customized to your family's needs, and you can reward kids for a job well done. And this is a game changer because otherwise, in the old days, we would ask them to do the chores. We would try and track it. Maybe they didn't always get paid for what they had done. Then there was a disagreement about, did you pay me for this or that? And then like the love of chores went away really fast. It's about consistency and it's about helping parents teach their kids these valuable skills that set them up for success in the future. So six million parents and kids are learning about money on Greenlight. It's the easy, convenient way to get kids on the right financial path. Sign up for Greenlight today and get your first month free when you go to greenlight.com slash fluster. That's greenlight.com slash fluster to try Greenlight for free. Greenlight.com slash fluster. This episode is brought to you by Trumetta. It's a premium supplement company based out of California that strives to make self-care easy. One of their great products is mushroom coffee. It is a must for your morning routine and it tastes delicious. It has no mushroom aftertaste, only the benefits that mushrooms bring. And this organic premium coffee blend has lion's mane mushroom for productivity, reishi mushroom for immune support, cordyceps to boost your energy, and of course, caffeine to give you the kick that you need every day. Yeah, we need that caffeine. So start your 2024 healthier with True Meta Mushroom Coffee and see for yourself how it helps you to focus so you can get stuff done. You'll feel an uptake in your productivity every time you drink it. Trumetta offers their best deal to Flusterclux fans. You'll get a free electric mixer and 40% off the coffee plus free shipping in the U.S. So go right now to trumetta.com slash fluster to fuel your productivity and creativity with some delicious mushroom coffee. That's T-R-U-M-E-T-A dot com slash fluster. Maybe you think seeing a therapist would be helpful, but you don't feel like you have the time to find one and you're not sure if you could afford one. So try Talkspace. By doing everything online, Talkspace has made getting the help that you want accessible and affordable. I don't know if you've noticed everybody, but life is a little crazy right now in a lot of ways. Job change, a death in the family. Don't delay. It really does help to have a trained professional available to you to work through some of life's really big and smaller problems. With Talkspace, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you within typically 48 hours. Which is great. There's no need to commute to appointments. You won't miss time at work. And you don't have to line up childcare in order to attend your sessions. It's really meant to be mental health care made easy. The ability to do virtual sessions is, is really helpful. It just allows you to get the help you need without feeling like you have to completely disrupt your schedule, your life, or your budget. It's the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, substance abuse, relationship issues, and so much more. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $80 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster to get $80 off your first month. That's Talkspace.com slash fluster. Okay, we're back. Okay, so full disclosure, I was not a dater. You were much more of a dater than I was because I met my husband when I was 17 and 
you know, that was it. But so here's my current exposure to dating is that I started watching Sex in the City back from the first episode again. I sort of dabbled in it. I know that you were totally connected to it. I didn't have HBO back then. I don't even remember what I was doing. I was never really dating. You had a whole dating life. I mean, I had a few little crushes and things, but I wasn't dating Timothy Hutton. He wasn't available. So the thing about this, the whole uncertainty about dating also, I think, which makes it tricky, and if you're talking to your teenagers about this, is technology just makes it so much different because we can see so much of what other people are doing, and the expectation is that you're going to have constant contact. If there are things that you are wondering about, if you have doubt, one of the things that we do when we have doubt about something is that we seek more information. So if we go back again to that silly example of you've got some weird bump on your ear, People who tend to perseverate about things, who worry about things, they'll start researching. So one of the things I say to my clients all the time is you got to stop the researching because that's a sign that you're getting pulled into your anxious pattern. But if you are dating somebody, you can see where they are. You can look at their texts. You can reread texts. Every single post that they make on social media then becomes something to analyze. That's right. And so when we're talking about dating and we're talking about relationships, if you're listening to this as a parent of a young person who's sort of stepping into that arena, it is really important to talk very openly about what the expectations are, about how much contact and how much you're going to talk to your friends about it. It really is okay to start to talk to kids about the way this shows up. One of the things I was just doing a talk last night, and as I often do, I was talking about tracking because that's one of the things that parents want to know about. And it's one of the things that I feel strongly about. And tracking in relationships between young people now is becoming more and more common. Instead of just saying, oh, I can look at the social media posts or I could reread her texts or I could replay her voicemails, I can also track her or him, sometimes in agreement between people that they're going to track each other in order to get as much information about where that person is. And so we just want to think about how it is we go about trying to eliminate all doubt and when does it cross a line that... I am not going to let this person have independence or autonomy or have a life without me because I need to know exactly where they are and what they're doing all the time. That is a new expectation that we can pull off with today's technology. You mentioned that before, and since that hasn't come up in our household, because we don't track because... I couldn't handle the side eye from you, and I agree. It doesn't make sense. It would be more than side eye, girlfriend. When they start tracking, do you think, like if your clients have talked about this, do you think that it's presented as like a good idea of like, yeah, if we track each other, we'll know where we are so we can see each other more. Like it has like a benevolent original intention, but they don't realize it's also because it's providing so much information. Yeah. Sometimes it's benevolent. Sometimes actually it's a little bit of a red flag. So sometimes a client will say to me, oh, well, she wants to know exactly where I am all the time. Several years ago, I had a teenage boy, and the mom was really concerned about his desire to track his girlfriend. And he was presenting it as, this is just how much I love her. And the mom was hearing it as, you're kind of a stalker. And so there is a fine line. The same thing happens within families. I track you because I love you and I want to make sure you're safe, versus I track you because I need to know for my own comfort, my own certainty, I need to know where you are all the time. When your children are sort of stepping into this arena, I think it's really, really important for you to talk openly about what's healthy and what's not. Back in the old days, some of you may remember that there were limits put a friend or a boyfriend or a girlfriend wasn't allowed to call your house after 9 p.m. That was a limit that your parents put on it. Because there was one line for the house. Yeah, there was one line and the phone would ring and it was disruptive. And parents also were saying, like, it is okay for you to be done with this person for the rest of the day. Now, of course, you know, I'm sure that if we think back there, you know, you would sneak a phone call and that would feel kind of illicit and that kind of stuff. But it really is okay to recognize, particularly if you are a family that has a lot of doubt swimming around in there, that tends to do this need for certainty. 
needs to do this checking in all the time, you really want to make sure that this doesn't become a part of your child's accepted behavior when they're in relationships. Because as we started off saying, it is kind of accepted, much more accepted that you're perseverating about a relationship than you're perseverating about a freckle. But the pattern is the same. And so we really want to talk to kids about what a healthy relationship looks like because we want kids to understand that some separation, some distance, and some autonomy is a healthy part of a relationship. And you want to model that with your own relationship with your partner and with your kids. So this is really hard stuff because the guy cutting my hair is probably like 30. He wasn't like 19. But here's what I said to him. (laughs) He did not (laughs) like it. (laughs) Because I think this phrase will mean a lot to people who did date a lot. We would use the phrase like, don't try and define it right now. Okay, you're in this new relationship. We're going to define it. Who are we to each other? What is this? That actually has nothing to do with the authentic nature of the intimacy that is being developed. That is the anxiety needing to label and add certainty to something that is scary and vulnerable. So this guy in this situation had just started seeing someone and then I was on a cruise ship for work. So he then had to like leave for three months. And so he was like, are we official? Are we a thing? Are we this or that? And he'd only dated him for like a week before he left for three months. And I said, here's the thing. You aren't much of anything yet. Be in the moment. Enjoy each interaction. Don't focus on the future and see at the end of this three months when you get back together, what is it like to be together? Be curious. Don't be insecure and don't need that. I was thinking of like, how do you just sort of date from this place of being at peace in the moment, which is really hard. I know I'm throwing that out there because I don't think I did that very well until the very end of my dating. Right. We like to project into the future. So a lot of relationships at the beginning, we bring in a lot of our fantasizing about where it's going to go and it feels good. The other thing to remember too is that the beginning of a relationship, so if you've got kids that are starting to date and this is a new thing for them, they are feeling things that they never felt before. We're saying to young people, look, you're going to be feeling things in all sorts of ways that you've never felt before. And also, We want you to have these really sophisticated skills of staying in the moment, of being rational, right? And it's a really hard combination. Part of it is, as a parent, is being able to navigate the fact that they're going to be kind of all over the place, and your job isn't to control the -the all-over-the-placeness. Your job is to be the voice of, hey, just pay attention to this. Just pay attention to that. And then the other thing is you want to look for patterns, just like we look for patterns all the time. If you're listening to this and you're a single person who's dating or you've got kids that are dating, do you do the same thing over and over again that actually leads to problems? Do you have a pattern of jumping too far ahead and having expectations for a relationship that's two weeks old that are really the expectations you might have if the relationship were six months old? Do you spend a lot of time perseverating, thinking, trying to interpret somebody's texts or whatever? Is that a pattern that you get stuck into? They talk about that in Sex in the City. I don't know if you've seen that episode, but they refer to it not in a clinical term, but they accuse Charlotte of having the pattern of the misses all eggs in one basket. With every new date, let's project, is this the one? Is this? It's so common. Yeah. And similar to that is sort of the perfectionism. We've got both sides of the spectrum here. On one hand, we don't want you to ignore, because there are some people then who ignore the red flags that show up. So it's really not a good fit, but you sort of ignore that. Like this guy has said, I want to track you and make sure I know everywhere that you go. And you say like, oh my God, that means he loves me. There's that end of the spectrum. And then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is sort of like the Jerry Seinfeld problem on that show is the perfectionism thing. That as soon as one small little thing shows up that isn't perfect, then you're done with the relationship. So I think 
our friends at the other podcast, What Fresh Hell, maybe they do a segment like this, but it's like, how can you tell if you're old without saying you're old? We have a dating episode where we talk about sex in the city and Seinfeld. All right. Can we talk about friends or does that date us as old too? There aren't even TV shows we can talk about anymore, right? I mean, what are we going to talk about? I know. Now we're watching like documentaries on David Beckham or something like that. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about David Beckham's relationship. You want to look for opportunities with your teenagers. You want to look for opportunities with the young people in your life that are dating to just sort of plant these seeds and bring this to their awareness. I'm glad I never really had to date, I think. I mean, I don't know. And I certainly can't imagine what it must be like to date now as an adult with everything going on. In my 20s, when I was in New York, I was really into jazz. I'm very familiar with, say, The Standard. It's the classic American songbook. And there are two songs that are so great. I made my daughter listen to them, and I don't think she was super impressed. But I said, when you start dating, even though you will feel like your world is shifting, these are universal feelings, and nothing that you do will be invented by you. Other people have felt this. And so there are two great songs from the 30s. One is how long has this been going on when some woman finally realizes like, hey, this is hot stuff. Yeah. So the last time I heard that song, which was recently, is there's an Instagram video with a cat licking somebody's toothbrush. And then they're playing in the background. How long has this been going on? So continue. <laughs> yeah, it's totally funny. <laughs> Thank you for making that reference a little more current. Oh my gosh. Well, and then the other one though, that is just the most genius song is They Can't Take That Away From Me. Talk about healthy breakups. I played that and I was like, I want you to listen to this song because this is what a healthy breakup looks like. This is the emotional arc and journey of a healthy breakup. And I want you to listen to this and maybe one day this song will be useful to you. And it's all about still being in control and not being passive when the relationship ends. What was her response to it? An eye roll. Oh, that's on brand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm sure she was listening. And maybe one day she might say, oh, yeah, I remember that song. I love this song or something like that. Well, the thing I love about that story is that there are so many different ways to deliver messages to our kids about these things. And that's just one way. So you didn't sit her down and say, like, look, here's what you need to think about when you are going through a breakup. You said, listen to this song. And songs are memorable. And so you had a nice conversation with her. She may have rolled her eyes, but it was really a way for you to say, here's an example of something for you to pay attention to. You were talking about your family watching Friends, I think, during COVID, and you guys were talking about the emotional management skills of all the characters and friends. That's just grist for the mill. So I love that there was that song that you were able to convey, here's something to think about. The other thing that I did was that there was in her friend group a pretty nasty breakup. So then I said, How does this breakup sound compared to how your friend talked about her breakup? Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing if we're talking about relationships and dating and friendships and all that kind of stuff. When you're getting to know somebody, like we say, it's an audition. It's a trial run. It's like you're taking the car out for a test drive. And I also want kids to think about what are they showing to that other person. So we tend to think, well, I'm taking this car out for a test drive, but it's also a time for you to see whether or not you're a good driver. So if you're demanding that this person respond to you in 30 seconds after a text, if you're the person wanting to track this person, if you're the one who's talking about it all the time and perseverating about it, that's really important for you to talk about with your kids is how are you in a relationship? Because I think we tend to focus a lot on what is the other person bringing to the relationship? What does the other person do? And it really is good for us to talk about what are you good at in a relationship? And what do you need to pay attention to? What are you putting out there? Yeah, Yeah, what are what are you you putting out there? What are you putting on social media? Do you want people to see you as this kind of person? It's all practice, of course. Probably there are a lot of things, if we look at places where doubt is going to show up, if we look at places where it's just absolutely easy to try and find certainty, I will tell you that there are two places where it happens very, very often when I'm talking to people. One is about their bodies and their health. 
and body image and all that kind of stuff. And social media certainly contributes to that. And then the other is relationships. It just is absolutely low-hanging fruit for our worry and our doubt to show up and grab on because there is so much uncertainty. Life is uncertain. I say that all the time. People don't like to hear it, but it's absolutely true. And we are very often on a quest for certainty. It's going to show up for sure. Let's take a break. And when we come back, let's talk about some good conversations to have with our kids when they start dating. I'm Margaret. And I'm Amy. And together we host the podcast, What Fresh Hell? Laughing in the Face of Motherhood. Margaret, I would say you're sort of a where are my keys kind of mom. Correct. Sometimes a where are my kids kind of mom. (laughs) Well, you're Amy more of a we were supposed to leave 35 seconds ago, mom. I mean, touche. In each episode of What Fresh Hell, we come at a topic from our usually completely opposite perspectives. I bring the research. And I bring kind of the gimlet eye. Like, is that research really going to work, people? And almost 10 million downloads later, we're still laughing. We also talk to experts in the parenting field, plus parents with stories we can all learn from. We make each other laugh, we challenge each other's assumptions, and we have what we think is the best parenting community on the internet. Check out What Fresh Hell? Laughing in the Face of Motherhood wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay, so now back to the show. Well, let me ask you this question. First of all, I think that we have to be realistic with age-appropriate expectations. Mm -hmm. Of all the clients you've seen in the adolescent population, have many mastered healthy dating while in high school? Let me think about it. Mm. No. Life is going to require practice with this. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this is adolescence is in many ways the practice ground for all sorts of skills and certainly social relationships. This is why it's really great for teenagers to have jobs. We've talked about that in the past, right? Because that's really good practice. So yes, the answer is they're going to screw it up for sure. Yeah. You've got a combination of an age developmentally where connection is absolutely primal. Dan Siegel talks about this, that if you were an adolescent 2,000 years ago, your need to connect with your tribe meant your survival. So they are going to do whatever is necessary a lot of times to get that need met. And it's not going to look like we want it to look as parents. It's not going to look rational. It's not going to look well-developed. It's not going to be about, well, these are the things that I want in a relationship going forward. It's going to be about wow, it feels really good to be with that person. And I want to be with that person more. And I'm going to throw away a lot of things to be with that person as much as I can be. That's much more the typical path that this thing is going to take. And your question that you said before is that people as they're starting to date are not going to know how to do this. One of the mistakes I think that parents can make is, as always, talking too much and lecturing or saying, this is how you should do it, et cetera, et cetera. Because you're pushing back, as always, you're pushing back against some pretty strong developmental stages. Our role as parents, if you've got a child who's beginning the dating process, our role is that you're the guardrails and you're the seed planter. So if you think of yourself as a parent as the guardrails and the seed planter, That means that you're going to be clear about what the expectations are and what the rules are, and they're going to work to break the rules and do things behind your back, which is totally normal for teenagers. And you're going to be the seed planter and hopefully the role model for how do we develop connection with people over time. And so do not expect that your young person, your 13-year-old, your 16-year-old is going to have these skills but it's your opportunity, just like if you were teaching them how to play tennis or how to bake bread. It's an evolution over time in which you are pointing things out. And here's a little rule of thumb. Here's a little tip. As a therapist, one of the things that I do and one of the things that works is that we start with other people as examples before we bring it right to ourselves, because that brings down the defensiveness. This is why watching friends and talking about emotional management patterns is such a great thing to do. 
Never Have I Ever, right? That's a more contemporary show. Yes, and we both loved it. Yeah, we should have been talking about it the whole time. But that's a great show that has all sorts of relationship examples that are really good conversation starters and opportunities for that. And it was a great display of that instant lust attraction connection versus the real peer, the real friend, the one who meets you where you're at and really cares about you on a deeper level. That was a great show. Yeah, that was a show about relationships and friendships and identity and trying to figure out who they were in all sorts of different ways. I mean, the writers of that show really were very good at talking about all of those relational issues that come up in adolescence. I don't know that my kids, we talk about so many things, but I'm sort of expecting them not to say much to me when they date. I mean, because I haven't been there as a parent yet, but I have a feeling they'll be somewhat tight-lipped on this topic. And that's why I have always talked about certain songs or movies as these tools, because I say everyone has felt all these feelings and there are beautiful songs and beautiful love stories written, et cetera. And that's why like all of a sudden when you do start feeling the hormones, a new romance, you start hearing everything differently. Sappy lyrics all of a sudden sound different. Yeah, because they're connecting you with your emotions. And I think that's just an important thing is to remember this is a hugely emotional process, also driven by all sorts of hormones and all that kind of stuff. We want our kids to deal with it rationally. And as you say, you weren't really even thinking about it rationally until you were well into your 20s. Oh, yeah, like 26, probably. 26 or 27. Yeah. Okay. So in summation, everybody, this is a bumpy place to be. Remember that it's a place for doubt. And the thing you probably want to most pay attention to with your child and with yourself is are you getting into a pattern that really looks more perseverative or more ruminative rather than working? Not perfectly, they're not going to do it perfectly, and you're not going to do it perfectly, but stepping back and trying to develop skills over time and awareness over time, knowing it's going to be a bumpy road. Thanks for listening. And if you found this podcast helpful, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find this information. And if you'd like to dig deeper on any of these topics, we have specialized playlists on our Spotify profile and the link is in the show notes. Topics like teens, depression, and OCD. Bye, Lynn. Bye, Robin.